Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jamie. I'm the Director of Operations at Women and Children First in Chicago, but I'm joining you tonight from my mom's porch in Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> I was so excited for this conversation that I offered to introduce on my vacation tonight. Uh, we are so glad you're joining us for this virtual conversation between Vanessa Vasalka and Melissa Phoebos in celebration of the paperback release of Vanessa's novel, The Great Offshore Grounds. We begin our virtual events as we begin our events in the store, you know, whenever we can do that again, um, with the land acknowledgement. Please join me in taking a moment to acknowledge that the land on which the bookstore stands is the occupied and unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgements and the, about the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event at native-land.ca. Thank you. We're happy to say that our bookstore is open for browsing and you can also support us through our online stores. store. Our event calendar is packed. In the next month, we have virtual events with visionaries like Judy Chicago and Judith Human. And our first in-person signing in the past year and plus is coming up with the incredible Eve Ewing who will be doing an outdoor signing of her new book, Maya and the Robot on July 15th. Tickets for that event, along with information on all of our upcoming programming, can be found on our website. Some logistical crowdcast information you might need to know. Uh, during the event, if you have a question for either of our authors, you can use the Ask a Question box located at the bottom of your screen. And you can utilize the chat bar on the side of the screen to talk to one another. <laughs> You can also buy a copy of The Great Offshore Grounds by clicking the buy a book box that's at the bottom of your screen. So with that housekeeping out of the way, let's turn our attention to our authors. Vanessa Vasalka is the author of the novel Zazen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which won the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize and The Great Offshore Grounds, which was long listed for the National Book Award. Her fiction has been featured in Tin House and her nonfiction has been included in the Best American Essays. The Great Offshore Grounds tells the story of two half sisters and their adopted brother's quest to find out more about their parentage and their family history. This book is sweeping, but incredibly quick and snappy with characters who have erected high prickly walls around themselves as self-preservation, but who I didn't want to leave at the end of the book. Vanessa is joined in conversation tonight by Melissa Phoebus, most recently author of the essay collection, Girlhood. Melissa has been featured in the Paris Review, The Believer, Sweeney's and Granta, among other publications, and we are thrilled to have her with us tonight. So now I will thank you once again for joining us, and I will hand the virtual stage off to Vanessa and Melissa. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jamie. You, Jamie. Um, I am, what an honor to be here with you, Vanessa. I am obsessed with this book and have a huge writer crush on you. Um, <laughs> will you read to us for a little bit before I start peppering you with questions? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna read from a couple of different sections just to try to give people a taste. Okay. Back across the sound in Seattle, Livy looked out the window of her basement apartment. Her father was getting married that afternoon, and though it was already late April, a cold, wet breeze still whistled through the gaps in the caulking, turning her skin to goose flesh. A few feet away stood her sister, Cheyenne, poorly slept and already dressed. I'm freezing, said Cheyenne. Turn on the space heater. Turn on the oven. They charge us for electricity, said Livy. Cheyenne rolled her eyes, but went over to the little white gas stove. Cranking the temperature to broil, she leaned back against the oven door so she could feel the heat on her hamstrings while the oven warmed. Yesterday, they'd spent the entire day picking rocks out of Livy's landlord's garden and trade for a patch of soil near the sunny side of the fence so that Livy could grow food. It wasn't political. Livy didn't care about pesticides or permaculture. She was just the cheapest person that Cheyenne had ever known. She lived off past date groceries. She washed her clothes once a month with a teaspoon of dish soap in a tub. She made her own bras. Cheyenne was pretty sure she would have rinsed and reused dental dams if she thought it would work. Recently, Livy had become convinced that she could feed herself off three square yards of land. It was ridiculous, but since Cheyenne had appeared out of nowhere and moved in on her without warning or rent, she didn't have much of a say. 
Taller and unfreckled Cheyenne had chosen a rose-colored capped sleeve shirt with eyelets and a pair of black pinstripe suit pants. She could pass in the crowd they'd be in today. Her second-hand clothes came off as vintage, while her misadventures in body art made her seem a fine vase, badly, chapped, uh, badly chipped and cracking, but a gritty accent to any room. Cyril didn't come to my wedding, said Cheyenne. Why should I go to his? Did you invite him? Hell no. He would have arrived like a lord and expected to walk me down the aisle. Here, let me give you away. Oh, hey, Dad, I think you pretty much already did that. You're right, she said. He would have. So why are we even going, said Cheyenne. I have the day off work and it's cheaper than a movie. I'm tired of ramen and hot dogs and there'll be rich people food, so I'm taking Tupperware. Please don't make it obvious, said Cheyenne. We're already going to look so out of place. Oh, because you have jailhouse tats of hearts and clubs on your knuckles or because I don't shave and look like a landscaper? Cheyenne put her fingers on her left hand. Not just clubs and hearts. The one on my thumb is a diamond and the pinky is a spade, but you just can't tell anymore. Livy crossed to where she'd laid out her newly washed blue painter's pants and pulled them on over her long johns. I'm going to the wedding because it's a show of support that costs me nothing. At his worst, he's a big blank. I've never thought of him as a dad. He's just a disappointment. He gets a clean slate. That's my wedding present, a pass. It's the only decent move. I shot my better angels, said Cheyenne. They're angels. You can't kill them. If they were real, you could. Livy could feel Cheyenne's eyes burning holes in her ribs. She zipped her fly and flattened her pockets. I have clothes if you want to borrow something, said Cheyenne. Livy froze for a second, then bent down to roll the cuffs, making sure they were perfectly even on both sides all the way around. I have a white shirt. It has buttons. I can tuck it in, she said. What do you think the bride will be like, asked Cheyenne. We should get drunk before we go. I'd rather do it on his dime, says Livy. I bet inviting us isn't even his idea. I'll bet it's the bride's, Livy smiled. Maybe he has cancer. And the doctor warned him the guilt suppresses the immune system. Cheyenne propelled herself off the stove with her back foot. Yes, she said, no. And she held up her hand. Wait, I have it. He found God and God said to him, Cheyenne threw her arms wide and boomed. Stop being such a dick, a dick, a dick. Echo, echo, echo. Neither sister had seen their father since they were 14. The wedding invitation had arrived only two weeks before the date of the ceremony, just on the heels of Cheyenne's reappearance, something their mother, Kirsten, thought was prophetic. It was obvious from the short window that the decision to include them was at best the result of a long debate, or at worst, an afterthought. As girls, they'd been fed this, uh, a fairy tale about their mothers. Two women loved the same man. One wanted a baby, and the other wanted to chase the North Star. Each became pregnant, so they made a plan. The one who wanted the North Star would continue on. The first mother was happy, and the second mother was happy. But which daughter was which? It drove Cheyenne and Livy fucking batshit crazy. Kirsten had never given them a name. That's the mother. Uh, or a way to reach the other woman. She refused to say which girl belonged. I missed a paragraph here, so I'm just going to explain it. Forgive me. Um, it explains that the, the two sisters... Um, aren't sure who their mother is. The woman who raised them is the mother of one of them, but they don't know which one is which. Um, each had Kirsten's black hair and mannerisms, her broad shoulders, but so did a lot of people. Most pe mostly they looked like their father, Cyril, who they had not seen in years, who also had black hair. Every now and then though, one sister would see something in the other and think that's totally her mouth, but they could never be certain. And paperwork didn't clarify anything either. Theirs was a home birth, and Kirsten was listed as the mother on both birth certificates. So the first section that I read is the two sisters, and it starts when they're 33. And there is this old family myth, um, you know, that uh, their mother, Kirsten, you know, and another woman who are good friends both got pregnant at the same time and they by the same guy. And uh, one of the mothers left with both kids. Uh, they threw, you know, they got drunk. They threw the I Ching. They, you know, drank a bottle of wine. And one ended up with the kids, and the other went off to be a Buddhist nun. Um, and this is when they're 33, and they've never had the name of the other mother. And, and there is this wedding. And in this wedding, you know, um, their father, who is kind of a non-entity, gives them the name of this other woman. 
and it sort of sets in motion the beginning of the book. Um, and they've been raised in poverty, and uh, he's very rich. Um, and so when they go to the wedding, you know, they think they're going to get money, and they don't get money. This is what they get. Problems often seems to happen. So I'm going to read uh, a section to introduce the mother a little bit, and then one short section that I think gets to the heart of sort of how I think of what the book is about, which is essentially America <laughs> in a lot of ways. So the name of the other mother at this point is Anne. This is Kirsten, the mother. What did she know about Anne anyway? Even if she'd wanted to tell the girls, she knew Anne was a Buddhist, but not what kind. She knew Anne traveled extensively, but not how. Perhaps she had married well or come into money. It was also possible that cut away from children and the need to shell out money for a two bedroom apartment for 20 years, Anne had simply floated upward in the realm of home ownership and 401ks and healthcare and cars with airbags. Kirsten looked at her laptop where several windows were open, all healthcare plans, none of them worth a shit but she was tired of getting bounced on and off Medicaid every time assholes in the legislature decided to redefine poor. Normally she could weather the tides of eligibility, but not this time. Something was wrong and she didn't know what. Her stomach hurt, her appetite lagged. She'd gone for her annual at the women's clinic and everything had seemed fine, but she knew her body well enough to feel the change. She went to the tarot cards and did a few readings. She got the lovers and the star and the universe, and of course, who doesn't want all of that? Then she clicked through the benefits of each plan. Any pre-existing conditions? Oh, I don't know. How about capitalism? So here she was, wide awake, in the blazing daytime, having scrolled through online postings and now sitting with nickel ads flayed to the classifies looking for a job. You can't just call anymore. That's a flag. You can't ask a reasonable question like what shift or how much an hour? That's a flag. You can't even walk in and fill out an application. Everybody wants a goddamn resume. Whore out your personal charms just to wash dishes. A flexible team player with experience and a positive attitude wanting to move ahead. She annotated in her mind. Flexible, she crossed out. No boundaries, no kids. Experienced, she crossed out. Needs no training. Positive attitude, she crossed out. Obsequious yet entertaining. Wants to move ahead, she crossed out. In responsibility but not pay. For years, Kirsten had made her own deal with the government. I fill out the paperwork, you give me money to live on. It was an honest paycheck in her opinion, a real allocation of federal funds to support the work they should be doing and they weren't. How many nights had she spent on the suicide hotline talking someone off the ledge? The number of times she'd opened for the early shift at the domestic violence center. Every night she showed up reliably alive, not dulled by meaningless jobs. She met the messed up world intact and offered it an all hours humanity. The government has gotten more than their, mo their money's worth. They're fucking lucky I only charge them food stamps and eight fifty a month. But none of it looked real on paper. She closed the nickel ads. If you were over 25 and looking for a job, everyone expected a pageant of humiliation and a really good story. Are you a recovering addict? Are, are you married to a bride hoarder? Are you a homemaker new to the market? with an autistic son or a husband with cancer? Tell me, no, really, you can tell me. What exactly is your excuse for being 52 and broke? It's not like she didn't know how to weather the opinions of others. A mom of two toddlers at 20, living off food stamps, she was used to the scouring glance in the DSHS office when the girls crawled on the floor and then ran wild over the seats, then squirmed and fought and yanked hanks of hair out of each other's heads. If she ignored it, she got told off for not disciplining them. If she yelled at them, she got told she was abusive. And both girls were hard in their own way. Cheyenne was a danger to herself in public. Livy was a danger to herself in private. They were, she was unreadable when you most needed to read her, whereas Cheyenne would tell you point blank every shitty thought she'd ever had about you. But Cheyenne had a deep sense of wonder. She could see herself in the stories Kirsten told. She was mythic by nature, or she had been. Kirsten couldn't seem to get anything out of her that way anymore. And there weren't any federal pro aid programs for that. Hello, ma'am. Can you tell me which form I should fill out for a failure of faith in the universe? It would be pages for sure. How long has it been since you last had faith in the universe? 
Have you tried to have faith in the universe in the past week? I'm going to read one last section. And then, uh, so the sisters go on a trip across country and then multiple trips to try to find this other mother that they know nothing about. And I want to read this section just because the book in many ways is about America and about the history and the land we walk on and what we have inherited, whether we want it or not. A few hours past Missoula, the land changed again, flattening and turning brown, scoured by wind. They crossed the Yellowstone River, and then they followed it as it ran north by northeast, fed by the Yellowstone Lake. It had poured over the falls through the Black Canyon before they ever knew it. Past Billings and the Yellowstone joined the Bighorn, which carried with it the little Bighorn and the tongue. As they drove, they saw signs for reenactments. Custer, stand with or against? Your choice. And they heard talk of the, in the rest area of a magnificent new state-of-the-art jail created from nothing but investor money and high interest loans. Then they came to the Great Powder River, which was fed by the Little Powder, as well as oil from pipeline breaks, Red Clouds War, the benzene, all of it flowing as it joined the Yellowstone, the Yellowstone, which had already inherited so much. The big horn and the wind and the tongue as it flowed towards the Missouri River, which had no choice but to inherit the watershed as it drained towards the Mississippi, that unstoppable force. And maybe there is just no way out of history. Maybe no matter how much you want to come from a different story, you can't. They traveled from the high uh, elevations in the scrubland to the prairie to the chain stores and settled in the doldrums, flat grass, sunburnt and feral, another unwelcome thing on the land. After Miles City, they dropped south through the hunting grounds of the Crow people. In the periphery, Livy saw a new future, free again. Cheyenne saw a woman with a changing face. Now this, now that, the mother narcotic. Maybe a different past would mean a different future. Maybe there was a his different history to claim. Passing through the Black Hills, north of Mount Rushmore and Pine Ridge, south of the Bakken Formation and Standing Rock, they drove the Badlands. East of the coal beds, west of the Black Hills, they passed a rash of square and Sputnik era buildings, each half as tall as flagpoles in front of them. An elementary school, a middle school, a high school decorated with signs leading to bomb shelters, furnished with government issued desks made of moonshots and school bells, cocked like a gun for lunch periods and air raids. They passed the white chalky bit pits of bentonite clay terraformed by bulldozers, missing only the great hand of a giant three-year-old descending from the heavens. There were ripples in the land. The sun was bettina on the highway. Tangled spaghetti creeks glinted in irrigated farms lined, one beside another like jade mahjong tiles. They could hear the subsonic songs of the red rock and the scrub brush. In an unsparing white flash of midday light, they drove through the miles of the cash crop ethanol, a pentimento of buffalo skins behind it, untanned and rotting in piles on the prairie. They too were shadows. Drive to the sea here, drive to the sea there, raise a great army, Nantucket, to the Arctic, to Panama, growing in all directions like a deep breath. They, grow, they drove across the great American desert, an empty and lifeless wasteland. It stretched from the Midwest to the Rockies and served as an initiation for pioneers and speculators seeking the spoils of the West. Only the desert was not lifeless and it was not empty. It was not the Kalahari nor the Gobi but a prairie overrun with life, a prairie covering a great aquifer from which grain, future dust bowls, the Monroe Doctrine, all would be drawn. Wagons brought whale oil to new towns, oil for light and lubrication, bones for corsets and collar stakes, ivory for the keys of Midwest parlor pianos. Girls stretched their hands over the wide white keys, dreaming of marriage, future typists, future salaried masses, secretaries, Tapping out notes, imagining still a world made of whale teeth and rib cages, brown fat and ambergris. Was this where it had all gone wrong? Livy saw a man in the arid expanse, flickering in and out of existence, preening in an Elizabethan rough with a fistful of charters. He bent down to check the soil for tobacco. Finding it too dry to plant, he strode forth, oscillating over the steppe, to the gold and the salt and the light, rumored to be in the hills to the west. She watched him vanish into a pinprick in the rear view mirror, a small white star degenerating towards collapse. So. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you read this. Longer to read than I had timed it out as. So 
my apologies. No, don't worry about it. I honestly was like, oh, can she just continue to read to me for the rest of the evening? And and uh, truth be told, part of, um, I read most of the book in the book, but we were on the road for part of it and I can't read so I get sick. And I uh, I listened to part of the audiobook. Um, and the narrator of the audiobook is one of my favorite narrators of audiobooks. She's amazing and her voice actually is not that dissimilar from yours. So it was, it was really, really good to hear. Decent. And uh, yeah. she and I, she was great because she had me read um, uh -huh. multiple sections and she timed. Um, wow. So, and then they That's amazing. Me. I was given a real deep. I am so me. glad to hear that. I love her work. I, I, I was like, oh, it's her. I don't know her name, but she narrates like so many yeah. of the books that I listen to and love. And I'm, you know, I was like, if I ever have another narrator and they let me say, I'm going to be like, I want that woman. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was really cool. Ugh. Vanessa, this book is amazing. It is like, this is, I, I did not plan on saying this, but like, as you were reading it, I was like, I've been trying to think of a way to describe it. And you've written like, however, when I was in college, people used to talk in the most annoying way about like the great American novel. And I was like, oh, Vanessa has done it. She's written like the great American novel that I wanna read, like the only one <laughs> that I wanna read. Um, it's, it's, it's wise and intelligent and rangy and personal. And it is like the big fat womany novel I have been waiting for my whole life. So thank you for seeing it through. Um, and whatever it is, I, I don't know what exactly your vision was when you started it, but when I, as I was reading it, by the time I was like halfway through, I was like, how did she do this? How did she pull it together and make, it's so, um, you know, it was like Jamie was looking for the right word. It's like, it's snappy. It's so, they're funny and readable and it's like, it's fun to read and it is a great epic. I don't, I don't really, you zoom in and out um, with the most grace. So I just want to congratulate you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. I, um, it is, I don't know, this was, I have a bunch of questions for you and this is not on my list, but I just, as you were reading, I was thinking about how, as someone who also published a book in a pandemic with like myriad personal things and just like, there's been so much going on that I can't, people kept asking me how it felt. And I was like, I don't, I can't really feel it. <laughs> I could feel it while I was writing it, but I don't know what this, what is what. And I, and I was just wondering like, how has it been for you? Like, are you able to feel it? Are you, have you been, I don't know, you know, and, and you've published books before. So uh, publishing a book is not the like parade, I think that maybe we imagine it to be before we ever publish it. It's like really writing the book, that's the thing. But, but I was just wondering if you finished it and you were like, Fuck yeah. <laughs> so this book had such a long trajectory to come to publishing that like there, you know, timelines are always off when you, with publishing and in, in yeah. the moment. I mean, think the moment that it was hard, it's like, you know, for those of us who released a novel into, you know, the height of COVID, you know, my mom asked me, she was like, so how do you think it's going? I'm like, I don't freaking know how you think it goes releasing a book with bookstores being closed for the first six months the entire book release. Tell me how you think that goes. You know, <laughs> it was like, and it's like you have to laugh. Yeah. And it's yeah. like all of us in 2020, you know, there were a whole group of us and our paperbacks are all coming out now. Yeah. That like we released into a period where there were no, where bookstores, I mean, like you could go online and order something, but the basic function of people getting for writers like me that are, you know, I'm not a household name and it has been indie booksellers who have hand sold my work and like given me a career and there's no hand selling. There's no shelf talkers. There's no out on the table. There's mm -hmm. no browsing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was the hard part for me, oddly, um, cause I roll the punches on stuff like that for the most part. Uh, I have really low standards. I think I'm like, you know, if I didn't have to pay to publish it, right on you know i mean I, like i try to keep my standards low uh on the, on, on the sort of like glory factor but i think the thing that was hard is not having a book release party because that's that's where your friends get to come mm -hmm. you get to have that moment with them and other mm -hmm. people who are like 
in your neighborhood and part of it, you know, in your yeah, neighborhood. yeah. That moment says, "I made it here. I finished yep. it. I made it. Here it is for you. Like it or mm-hmm. don't like it." Mm-hmm. And you just get to, there's an it's not a fanfare. It's an intimacy, right? And that is and that. So that was something that I was surprised, but like it, that's what made it feel like it never happened. Yeah, and so. So it's been strange that way. I feel very fortunate also that, you know, it's coming out in paperback that it's not a given in the industry anymore. No, it really isn't. It really it, isn't. Oh, that, congratulations, you're getting a paperback. I'm like, wait a minute, that wasn't happening. I was like, okay. Again, rolling with the, you know. And so, but the book took me eight years to write. Mm-hmm. And, and it really you know, brought me close to emotional, like, just, I was in such states of despair. Your acknowledgements page, first of all, I read the acknowledgements page before I start a book, almost always. I'm like, who propped up this writer while this book was happening, you know? Um, And your acknowledgements page, and I say this with, like, no hyperbole at all, I think it might be the best acknowledgements page I have ever read, because it's so fucking honest. Like, it really made me tear up when I read it, because it is, like, the truth, you know? And as often as we can say, like, oh, writing a book is hard, like, what it asks, not only of us, but, I mean, maybe it goes back to that intimacy and why that's the important, that's where celebration becomes possible, is with the people that hold us up, you know, um, that watch it happen. And so like when you, oh my God. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to read from your acknowledgements page because that would be cringy, but, um, but you really talk about it being, um, kind of an odyssey to write the book, um, and how much you had to borrow from other resources in your life in order to do that. So I want to know anything that you want to share about what that process was like or, yeah, I mean, I would say that, like, to take a step back and explain if people don't know it, um, talk about economy. So economy mm-hmm. is something I think about a lot, you know, mm-hmm. economy, America, capitalism, economies, how, you know, uh, how they drive lives. Like, there's a lot in this book that is, if we were talking about it beforehand, that is driven by women's health, mm-hmm. you know, and economies mm-hmm. around that. Um you know, resource economies, there's a variety of things. Mm -hmm. Well, the economies around writing is unlike, you know, you know, Europe or some of the other places, like, you know, American writers are always going to have two to three jobs. Um, You know, I have a friend in, in Austria and, you know, he's an artist and he has had, you know, not only his college, his art school paid, like, you know, zero interest loans given as a young person, multiple grants, like, like the difference between him and me, it's mm-hmm. not that I, is that he has spent 25 years getting to fully mm-hmm. explore his ability to do his work and get better. Mm-hmm. The same stories we tell ourselves about Americans about up by your bootstraps and this and that is the same thing we tell our artists, which is, fuck it, you should be able to do it on two jobs with a kid. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I can really hard right and there are costs that come to -hmm. do that there are emotional costs that come from your support Mm -hmm. system can't take it away like the attention that goes to a book could go to a kid could go to a partner could go to a you know a second job you need you know so Mm -hmm. there's always these things that really hit women the strongest but they're Mm -hmm. always so any writing comes up against that question what right have you to do this Mm-hmm. Where's your labor how to be used, you know? And so I think when we talk about how writing novels or, or any work can be hard to put it into terms that are really blunt, because I don't think that what you're saying or what I'm saying, while there is a great emotional price to doing certain kinds of work, I don't think that that's what we're, we're not saying, oh, it's hard to have an interior life that I have to sort of <laughs> untangle and put into something. We're saying that there's a lot packed into the economy of getting yep. from one place to the other with it. And when you are in a long section, if you, you know, it's old man in the sea, you catch a really big fish and you have to try to take it back. Yeah. And catching a small fish is one thing, but if you catch a really big fish, like you may end up with no flesh on it by the time you come back. And it is really like that question of like, should I cut it away? Should I cut it away? Should I cut it away and go free? Like I definitely struggled with that in this novel mm. a lot. There were more- 
points where I felt like it was destroying my life and the life of my family and the economy mm. of my family and that, you know, I was really seriously harming um, yeah. by admitting it. And so, you know, that's, I think, the... Mm. Oh, I love it. I could listen to you talk forever. You know, and it makes me think of the, I'm so grateful for, you have to forget, somebody was named it for me the other day. I can never remember the thing. Uh, it's like investment something. Uh, like when you're at the DMV and you've been waiting for an hour and you're not, you haven't moved, but you've already invested, you know, um, oh, you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to lose what you've already put in and like, <laughs> like, or, or the other thing of like, yeah, you know, you yeah, really I, yeah. Yeah. I'm really it's glad people take terrible relationships yeah. a lot of times and yeah. you can have a terrible relationship with a work of art. It's true. I think that's the first word of your acknowledgments page is that writing a novel can be like a bad marriage, you know, yeah. where you get trapped and you don't want to lose your investment and have wasted all of those years. Um, but I, I mean, I'm grateful for that tethering because you did finish the book and it is this book. And I don't know, you know, I read in an interview of yours that you said, hold on, I'm going to go look at it so I can quote you correctly. Uh, the way I do my work in general is to really try to start with a premise. What do I not know how to write about? What do I think I don't do well? And what am I afraid of? And I relate to that so much, first of all. Um, but also, it's so brave because you're basically sort of signing up for like, what's the hardest job I can see <laughs> for me <laughs> as an artist, you know? And I'm going to yeah. just run headfirst toward that. So, like, what? what parts of this book already existed for you, at least in your imagination? Like, what were you walking towards when you started it? Nothing. nothing. I liked nothing. I, I came up with, so when I asked myself that question, I was like, I'm afraid to write about love because I think most love stories are kind of, you know what I mean? Like, they're, I, I don't know how I could do it in a way that would feel genuine, not like it has to be mm -hmm. the best. Thing, but like, how do I, I don't know how to write mm -hmm. about love. That feels mm -hmm. very, like, I'm not sure that feels very, you know, and so that was one. I don't know how to write about love. I'm scared to write about love and death. I'm scared to write about just in the sense of like, how do I do it? Well, these were technical questions. They weren't like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were, you know, they were technical questions. I, I don't know how to do that. Um, but, but also they were bigger because the question for me, you asked like, how did I envision the novel? Um, you know, I had to sit down and say, what, what were the novels? I, I, okay. So I wrote Zazen. Zazen had its kind of like cult. That's my mm -hmm. first novel. Mm -hmm. Cult hit in its way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's out actually again. Uh, it's getting reissued on vintage in October. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm very excited about that. Uh, but, you know, very, very political novel, very, very, um, you know, first person narrator driven, um, definitely not a love story in the way that, you know, um, and I think that I, I came out of there and I was like trying to figure out what I wanted to write. And, and I said, well, what, what were the novels I loved the most? And I had to be honest that the things I loved, while I've been like really influenced by like avant-garde writers and, you know, beat mm -hmm. writers, all the things, I thought about the novels I loved the most was like War and Peace. It was, you know, <laughs> it was the big 19th century novels. Yeah. I, loved yeah. I just loved them. And um, and I was like, well, what do they have in them? It's like, well, they're all, they all have love and death. And they all have, you know, they all are trying to, like, eat the whole buffet, you know? And and I just kind of, like, go big or go home. Like, you know, I, I so I was like, okay, I'm going to try to write a big novel. I'm going to write my version of a 19th century novel. I'm not the first person. Franzen's, that was one of his aims, you know? I'm not the first person to say I'd like to try to write. But I was like, I want a 21st century, 19th century novel that I could pick up mm -hmm. and feel the way I felt in those novels, but mm -hmm. recognize around. Mm. So I didn't know how to do that was the only problem. And I didn't know what it was about and I don't plan anything out. So I, I start by rewriting. Whoa, wait, wait. you don't plan anything out. There was no outline for this. Oh my God. <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> I didn't know the characters. I know oh, that. God. I did, uh, so I start by free writing dialogue. Um, and because, you know, I say something and then something says something back. 
-hmm. And then it only takes one or two times before I realize somebody's got an opinion and somebody's got a problem. Like yeah. that's just, it emerges out of that. And so I started free writing dialogue, which is how I started Zazen too. And, yeah. and it gives me a way in. And then I just start kind of like, uh, free writing. And, yeah. uh, a lot of the stuff that it works for me as a process. And then I try mm -hmm. to go as far as I can without knowing anything about what's going to happen. So, um, I explained it. I think this is the best way I've explained it before. I know characters, Greek destinies. Like I know the sense that like, you're going to have to beat your mom on the road. Like, right. Whatever. <laughs> maybe thing up the Oedipus thing, but maybe he meets his dad on the road. I know. I wish but, he met his mom on the road. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, that, so, and slept with his dad <laughs> i don't know how this happens yeah but i know you have to end up here and i mean that emotionally like i know the arc emotionally of what yeah. that character is capable of and not able to access at this point but i don't mm -hmm. know how and so i just free write forward and i consider it a victory if i can get three quarters of a way through a novel and have no idea how it's going to end mm -hmm. and i did that my first novel where i just continued to cut off paths and I remember getting to the end, I'm like, well, I've cut off this path and I've cut off this path and I've cut off this path and I've cut off this path. And like, I started to have that heart racing kind of like, how are you going to work this out? And I just go like, I'll figure it out when I get there. You know what I, mean? like, I, I love like, that. I love that. Through a long process. Yep. And it makes so much sense. I will tell you something funny about the business end of it is like, you know, so I'd said the thing I was, had a hundred pages at a certain point and had been talking about you know, my version of the 19th century novel when I met with somebody in the industry and I was at a different publishing house and they said, well, you know, we know you're trying to do a really robust, polished social novel. And I went, no, wrong 19th century novel. <laughs> <laughs> I learned from that that you have to actually explain which 19th century novels because I was like, wow. oh, not, like, oh, oh, not that 19th century novel. No. This 19th century novel, you know. And That's really funny. I, oh. You know, so anyway, wrong. Oh, thank God. I love it. I cannot believe you just wend your way through. I mean, I had so many questions come up while you were talking. But first of all, it, I love hearing that about the dialogue because the, your dialogue, I mean, there are so many pleasures to be found in, in this book. Um, but the dialogue is maybe the most pleasure. Like just sitting and listening to your characters talk is so, especially Livy and Cheyenne. I, and, Oh, and Kirsten, like, I there was a part of me when you were talking, I wanted to um, ask you two personal questions and you can opt out of either of these. Um, and one of them, I think I probably already know the answer. Um, but I was wondering which of the, which of the characters in the book you most identify with and if it is Libby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Um, I have, if I'm going to be fully transparent, I had a friend of mine who knew me fairly well and, and was somebody who, you know, I really do honestly see myself in Essex. I see myself, mm -hmm. in, see myself you know what I mean? Like I, I really do, you know, I have to be able to know these characters a little bit to, to write them. But I did have a friend who said to me, so the way it looks from the outside, which feels different than how it feels in the inside, say, say to me that um, <laughs> Cheyenne is you drinking, Olivia is you so That's and, how I felt. <laughs> so, I was like, um, yeah. Hmm, that's funny. You know, I don't, it's interesting because I don't see myself in Livy in a lot of ways, but I've come to realize that other people, I see Livy and I think she's so much more together than I am in certain ways. And, and I think that sometimes people see me in mm -hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But Livy to me, it was really, okay, so let me, you know, feminist bookstore, let me jump on the. <laughs> Let's do it. The, every time I get to watch television where like a master female actor gets to like grumble around a scene saying nothing, I'm like, fucking right on. <laughs> You know, I've been waiting for like the inarticulate, you know, like woman mystique to just like actually become okay. For those of us who are writing in this world where like you had to explain over and over that like it's not a lack of interiority. They're, you know what I mean? Like Holden fucking Caulfield can wander around forever doing jack shit and it's considered art. 
But if a woman mm-hmm. walks across two pages and hasn't like shed a tear or explained her emotional like you know withholding, well, I don't know her. I really right. don't feel like we know her. And like that is only five years old yep. in terms of editorial conversations. Yeah. I, I just don't feel like we get to see into her. It's like that's right because you don't own. You know. Anyway. So yep. I think the question of likability, which is, you know, people have talked about now for the last four or five years, but it's also, um, it's also about like how forthcoming. Mm-hmm. And we're only now just starting to see and allow women to have mm-hmm. their as character, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. means that, you know, what's happened before with the male mystique is, you know, a guy character can walk around forever and <laughs> we as a culture project the mystique mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depth or this or that, like how he holds his damn cigarette. Oh, that's it's this, you know, it mm-hmm. all said that like there's this kind of this way that we read into all of the emotions and and, and do the work for that. Right. Mm-hmm. And yet with women, they're not allowed that. And so I think Livy to me was really I was very fortunate, I think, that. I could write her and find editors and other people who could handle the fact that, I mean, there's there's a you know a trauma in there. There's other things that she handles things her own way. Mm-hmm. She is mm-hmm. not something that sits and you know, yep. has a lot of. It's also third person, you know, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and there's a degree of like how what does closeness look like when one character mm-hmm. is much more than another mm-hmm. but um yeah i so i think i don't see myself in livy as much but i think i i may be more in there than i realize mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's really interesting um i mean i definitely um found parts of myself in all of the characters like i felt very attached to all of these characters in a way that I was like, I need to know this Vanessa person because whatever organizing intelligence is behind all of these characters, like it felt like there were little parts of me sort of crumbled up into all of them. And I particularly at one point was like, I have this really sort of like interesting kind of um, frustrating, but like intense relationship with the Cheyenne character. And at a certain point, like halfway through or whenever she was at the party with the bonfire and like, you know, I was like, fuck and then I was like oh that's right she's me before I got so you know where I'm just like I know her and I relate to her and I like find her so sympathetic and also I'm just like stop it (laughs) you know like like save these parts but please come with me I'm saving you to see she's not even got the excuse of being an alcoholic she's just kind of a torrent but uh, I know I know and I I mean I just love the the way that their paths end up, I won't offer any spoilers, but it just felt like that it felt the way that, you know, they they tell us that, and by they, I guess I mean like Tolstoy, <laughs> you know, the, the 19th century novel tells us that the ending has to be inevitable and surprising at the same time. And, and the ending of this book felt that way to me, where it's like, there's some things you see coming and others I'm like, I can't believe I didn't zoom, step back and see that that's the only way this could have ended. Um, but but I I arrived there completely fresh at the end. So um, it's really thrilling to hear you talk about eliminating those pathways, uh, which also feels, uh, I'm like, that makes sense to me as a person living on the planet where I feel, I was like, I know what that feels like in life and in work, where I only know I've got it right when there's no other path left, you know? It's also this question of potential. Mm-hmm. And it's a very American question. I mean, potential mm-hmm. is a world human experience. Yeah. But the idea of potential is very written into mm-hmm. the American myths, right? Mm-hmm. The idea of youth and potential. Yeah. Um, and novels themselves, one of the things I love about them is, you know, <laughs> sometimes I've said this in a, it, writing classes to people and they just find it horribly depressing. But <laughs> I have, the things I say that I think are hilarious and fun and freeing, often people find horrible and depressing. But I really like cool. a novel is you start with all possibilities and it's a world collapsing to zero. It's narrow. It goes to nothing. It's it's you have all all potential going to nothing, collapsing to zero. Yeah. And and that's every story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And 
I think that um, endings are very important to me. And uh, you don't know if they, because all endings are actually finished in the heart of the reader. Mm -hmm. You bring mm -hmm. it to a point, and then mm -hmm. only that person actually finish the ending. Mm. And you set up the situation for them to do it, and maybe it works, yeah. and maybe it doesn't. Mm. Meaning, like it's you know anybody who gets that far along in a book, they usually don't hate <laughs> it at that point. They give it up on it if they have, but they, you know some haters could stay with it a long time. <laughs> Imagine hate general, reading a really long book. I don't have it in me. Life is too short. <laughs> I know, but I know they're out there. So I believe it. Like, they are. But the, you know, I will time. say this is. I don't. That was a really beautiful way to describe endings. I suspect it's probably true. I don't know if I think it's always true, but it is true in this book. Absolutely. I was just completely all in with the characters, and there was you leave space at the end for like whatever needed to happen inside of me um, with those final moments and everything that I'd been through with them. It was really, it felt like a capacious place at the end of the book, you know? Thank you. So congratulations on that. Um, I can't believe how few of my questions I've gotten to, but um, I do want to open the floor to our participants. If folks want to click on the ask a question link at the bottom of the screen, uh, we would love to hear your questions. Um, and Vanessa will do her best to answer them. And I will keep an eye on that. Please do submit them. Um, I guess I want to, what is it? What do you do with those characters now? Like, are you, when you finish something like this and it has been eight years of your life and do you say goodbye to them? Do you part ways or do they stay with you? So I think the hard part, so when I wrote my first novel, one of the big questions I had to think about at the end was, well, two things. One, I'd been living in that novel, that one, for three and a half years. And my experience of it was, you know, I went on this, like, I am a very particular, very, like, tinkerer, very slow writer. So I have to work, I have to write a lot of hours hmm. to get to what, I, you know, <laughs> I was up at, I was at a McDowell at one point, and I decided to go around and survey everybody who was there and say, how many, how many words do you write a day in the ideal circumstance, right? How many do you write a day? And I found that all the short story writers wrote about four to 600 and all the novelists who were there were like 10,000 and like you know, between two and 10,000. And I was like, aha, this is the problem. I write long, I'm gonna write a long novel, but I write like a short story, right? So, it just takes a lot of hours. So I went in in that three and a half years and I worked four to five hours a day, five to six days a week for three and a half years. And then you realize that all the relationships that you have tended, investigated, learned more about, spent time with, mm -hmm. were with imaginary freaking people. And like you come out and the people that like, you know, are kind of like, I'm like, why didn't I get invited to that party? It was like, everybody thinks you're dead, you know? And so, <laughs> There is this kind of loss of, but this is the world I know. Mm. These are the relationships I've been mm. in. And then I also had the question at that point, because it was a first person narrative, like, wow, how much of the voice of this narrator is mine and how much belongs to the book? What do I get to walk away with and keep? That was a hard question. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think with this book, it was even more so on the characters. I spent so much time with them, but I think I was able to let go of it. There were a couple of people along the way with me who read a lot, and I sometimes felt like they were more obsessive about it than I was. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. Those characters are always with me. Yeah. I'm not going to write another story with them. Yeah. Uh, they're always yeah. with me. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes sense to me that your readers would be more. I have a good friend of mine who I actually met at McDowell. I read an, a novel of hers, the draft of a novel many years ago, and we were talking recently and she was like, well, I'm back on that novel and I think it's really close. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to get back and see so-and-so. And she was like, oh, the, that character's not there anymore. And I was like, what is this book? This is not the same book. 
there was no book without her. She was the primary tentpole. It was like, um, I think, yeah, as a reader, our relationship is a little bit different. We aren't part of the the evolution. You know, we don't get the the um, closure of writing them out of the story. You know, wait, this is just like, when were you at McDowell? What what year were you there? Two thousand and thirteen. Maybe fourteen. Yeah, I was there in, in two thousand fourteen. Um, yeah. I love that. Ask everyone their their word count. Oh God. Um, yeah, that, and word count because I was there a month and I divided by every single day and it was six six six. So I was like, okay, <laughs> this, this makes sense. But, yeah, I, yeah, that's. I because I am such a tinkerer too. I have to do the same thing. Where I actually, when I'm doing early drafts of things, if I don't have a tremendous amount of research, I have to impose a daily word count because otherwise it'll just be the same three sentences that I've got my like tiny little watchmaker tools out, and then you know they're going to end up in the trash anyway, probably by the end. So I have to sort of hit the benchmarks of like my two thousand words or whatever, or I'll never get through it. Yeah, and I played games. I played a lot of games, particularly when you get in the middle of something that's long. You know, I, I would oh. like take sections. Uh, so for the four for the characters, I would give them each um, a letter, you know, A, B, C, D, whatever. I would assign them a letter, and then there were a series of numbers to all of the sections that had to do with them. And then I would mm -hmm. also had the narration, which involves mm -hmm. some like Raleigh and you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I would do. Uh, is assign things and then take cards and then I would sort of randomly throw them out and then I would reorder the storyline across the <laughs> based by how they fell out and see what <laughs> happened. Right? Like, and I would say like, so I would like move things and then I had these jars of this because I was so freaking bored of writing this and so sick in my head. So what I would do is like, I like there were some bits of work that were paragraphed and some that were like entire chapters that were missing. And and I would draw a letter and a number and an indices there, you know, a, wow. another number out of there. And um, I would write on it for that section of the day. So what it meant for me is that every single day I got up, I didn't know what I was going to be working on. And I found that was great. I love that. Anything yeah. like I could be working on something that was like very close to done and I could just get very needly, you know, about it. Or I could be working on something that had nothing to it. But it was only so I started to play a lot of games, um, like a lot of games. Like I got no weird mental space. Book. I mean, I like. There Tell me one I'm, more thing. Tell me one more weird thing that you did. I can't believe I'm gonna say this. <laughs> I've never said this out loud to anybody who's not inside my family. I did some like really. I don't know that I can. We can call it deep meditation. Um, we can call it, you know, high imagination. We can call it like, you know, meeting with the spirits. I don't know. But I did some really deep, intense going someplace. It's at the worst part of like, do mm. I leave? This thing? Do I leave this thing behind? Have mm. I like it? And I had all sorts. I have a wild imagination and who knows wow. what's with it. I had all sorts of experiences. And one of the things I said was, you know, in my rant about like why I shouldn't be doing this, you know, one of the things I got back and I said, I don't even know how to fuck it. I'm sorry. I don't even know how to end it. And and the thing that I got back was all stories are end in the heart of the reader. Mm. Wow. And I've not found the advice to be bad. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, I... I, I pull out every stop I can to hmm. dance and uh, and go to war with and at my imagination mm -hmm. um, hmm. to shift gears constantly. I love to it. Or cut what's underneath and go force myself to stay in the moment of like resourcefulness. Yeah. We don't talk yeah. about resourcefulness, right? Yeah. Like to stay in the place of risk and resourcefulness. Yeah, I love it. It makes me think of um, Carl Jung and like the red book and like going into yep. the desert of your own mind, you know, like everybody else is like, she's gone crazy. <laughs> Maybe we'll never see right. her again. There's, and you come out I, with. Yeah. yeah, it was very much like that. And I constructed the center of the book through that process. I love um, it. Oh, that's so inspiring. It really is. I got a little 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 hairs up on the back of my spine. It's very good. Very good. And so encouraging also just to hear about 
you know, like the crazy impulses. I have spent a lot of time like cutting things up and hanging them from the ceiling and just like following weird impulses because the part of my brain that's thinking has failed and I have to find another way to see it. And it feels indulgent and ridiculous when I'm doing it and I just do it anyway and almost always it cracks something open and yields um, yeah. whatever, I, whatever it is I needed. And my great passion idea is, you know, any day of work you can do in your underwear is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like literally just around and like cutting things up and doing things like that. That's a yeah. remarkable luxury of certain moments, you know. It is. It really yeah. is. Certain certain madnesses are Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, um, as someone who's also had a lot of jobs and worked a lot of, um, I don't know, you know, like I, I remember being, uh, you know, in my twenties and trying to sort of get a straight job and where I like went to the same place every day and it just sucking the life force out of me and not in a like spoil kind of way, but I was like, I actually cannot, like I have no, I will just lie down and die. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so this kind of yeah. madness is so much more appealing. Right. And, you know, so work, you know, when I was, most of my writing life, I've always been working waitress jobs, driving nightcab that ends up in the novel. Like I was driving mm -hmm. nightcab. Mm -hmm. Working on a boat. Whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's, um, I've always worked mm -hmm. and I've always worked a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think women are constantly being told that, you know, they have to have a different role, that they're not, it's hard to fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, so my first novel, my daughter was five. I think when it, no, she's probably seven or eight when it came out, it was mm -hmm. five. I was, I had to get mm -hmm. emergency food. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. had to get um, mm -hmm. help in a lot of ways. It was on snap. And I, you know, I was stuck between work and I was looking all the time for it. And, um, you know, and I was writing and, you know, people were really quick, you know, it's very easy to say like, okay, but now yeah, they don't come to the guys mm -hmm. and they don't, say, oh, you need to like, you know, I mean, there is this thing and I'm not trying to be so binary about it in the way mm -hmm. that I'm talking about it, but like, mm -hmm. create important it is it really is and it's it's really important that it doesn't just live in the academy mm -hmm. and that it doesn't mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that it's something that is just like that feeds a kind of vitality that you know would make me a better cab driver or waitress just because I want to be freaking alive mm -hmm. you know and what I said a lot of other jobs is I don't want to be alive when I work yeah. there you know because yeah. I think you're carrying the weight of assumptions with it right mm -hmm. at least if you show up kitchen or I show up doing something physical. I've like cleaned hotel rooms. I've done a lot of janitorial. Like if yep. I show up doing stuff like that, I'm just showing up as me doing stuff like that. Yep. But you want me in a lot of those jobs to show up with a narrative, yep. with a yep. look and with like gratitude and with the assumptions of American yep. capitalism. Kind of do yep. and, and it's just like, that's a weight I don't want to carry necessarily for another 75 cents an hour, Yeah, you know? Um, yeah. And a healthcare plan you can't afford. Yeah, seriously. Right. So, yeah. mm. so I'm I a human it. organizer now. It and makes perfect I sense. <laughs> I love it. I love that you're doing that work. Hi, Jamie. Hi. So I've seriously spent the last like 20 minutes like this, just nodding and <laughs> loving everything you just said. Um, so I hope we have all the people who are on here that I can't see. No, I have enjoyed this so much. I'm going to walk away from this talking about um, this book as the great American womanly novel. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate it. And also, I just love the talk about craft. I could spend all day listening to people talk about their weird little things that they do when they're writing a book. So, But um, I just appreciate both of you so much. I am sorry that we are out of time. I'm sorry that it's really dark here. <laughs> um, but um, again, we um, have copies of the book available to purchase if you want to click the buy a book button 
um, below the screen, but also I seriously could spend all night watching you and listening to you, but um, I really appreciate both of you for your time and this great work, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you, Vanessa. I, I am in awe of you, and I love this book. Are you are you keeping this cover for the paperback? Yeah, yeah. this was the paperback. I got so beautiful. Oh, I got God. excited because I was like, "Trade fiction." <laughs> it's the most beautiful cover. Oh, it's, it's, it's a woman named Kelly. Oh my God, my brain is. I haven't had enough sleep. I've forgotten her last name. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will. I, Kelly Blair. Kelly Blair, Blair. Blair. it's on I, the back of the oh, yeah. <laughs> It's Kelly She's Blair. She's brilliant. We all saw it and we're like, whoa. <laughs> you know? It's and so you heard, good. That she that they really understood the book. There's so many mm -hmm. little details about mm -hmm. how it's done that apply to the book. I mean, just like greatest cover ever. It's gorgeous. I absolutely yeah. love I, it. You want to sit there and say, like, I, I felt like it was the only case. It was like, I think the cover is better than the book. No. <laughs> no. There's symbiotic. There are peers and partners. Yes. Yeah, she's great. And and uh, you know, if there I know there are awards for things like that and there's something's wrong if she doesn't win one. Yeah. That's it may have already passed. I just don't know the cycle on it. But. Thank, well, you. thank you again, um, and I hope that wherever you are watching this from, you go and buy the book, read it. It's amazing. Um, I appreciate both of you so much, and um, I think we're going to say goodnight. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks, everybody in the dark. <laughs> <laughs>